right, I'm Jeff Carlson with My Resource Library, and welcome to another issue of MRL Speaks. Today, I am with Rob Meyer from Meyer Fabrics. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, I was thinking before we actually started the call, uh, I was thinking, how long have I known Rob Meyer? And I will say, my family was your rep back in the early 2000s or late 90s, would be my guess, where um, I actually, my, I remember the first time I met you, I came over to Indianapolis to actually do a tour, and we were walking through a building that was such an old building in downtown Indianapolis, like, it was like an old warehouse, and, and I know you guys aren't there now, but you know the building I'm talking about, right? We still own the building. That was the building that the company was founded in by my great-grandfather. That building was actually built in the 1850s, and the company started in that building in 1897. The original area where the company was founded was actually a horse stable, and there was a farmer's market caddy corner from the building, and the farmers would come to the city with their produce to sell, they would drop their wagons at the farmer's market and take their horses to the stable to be stored while they were selling all of their produce. Uh, my great-grandfather actually started renting a portion of the horse stable to keep product to sell for repair of buggies, uh, fringe, leatherette, um, oilcloth windows, which would be called Isinglass, um, were all stored there in that room and then the following year, he actually moved to the adjacent building um, upstairs and rented that building and moved his mattress making business, which he had at his home, um, and the supply business to the upper portion of that. And then over a period of years, he acquired the four buildings that were there on the property, and the company remained in that location until five years ago when we moved to our new facility. So we were there for 119 years. Wow. Yeah, I knew the building was old. I, I forgot the history behind it, but for whatever reason, I just seem to remember as we were walking, some of the, just the construction of it was very interesting. It was post and beam, but all solid brick. The walls were two feet thick, solid brick. Um, the horse stable uh, where the company started still has the rings in the walls uh, where the horses would be tied up. And we, we actually still own the business or own the building and actually one of our clients now is renting um, a large portion of the building and doing reupholstery work out of the building. Nice, nice. So, uh, I mean, that gives, us, that gives us a really rich story of, you know, kind of Meyer's background. And by the way, I often get, is it Meyer or is it Mayer? Do you often get that question? We get that all the time. It is Meyer, like Oscar Meyer. Uh, <laughs> Mayer is the movie people. Um, but we will take orders when they place them for either. <laughs> very good, very good. Now, you actually still, you run the company, but you're with uh, family members too, right? Yes, I have three brothers in the business. So uh, two of my brothers, uh, one older and one younger, Rick and Mick, work on our government sector. And then my youngest brother, Steve, runs the finance and operations of the company. And then I work with all of the sales, marketing, and product development of the company. So we are fourth generation of the company, um, and we actually have a fifth generation working in the business as well. Nice. My older brother Rick has uh, uh, two sons actually working in the business. So. Well, it's it's fascinating. I mean, it's you know, I mean, you don't see a lot of it anymore. Like third generation is typically what I run into. I don't run into the fourth or fifth generation that are still in the industry. So. It's kind of fascinating to see the family all together. Yes, most companies are sold by the third generation. Either there's no interest in the business or they run the business into the ground or they try to overexpand the business and it doesn't make it. Uh, we have to give a lot of credit to our father. He was very frugal and left us in a great position. Um, but um, he took us from the residential side of the market to the commercial side in 1988. Um, and our business has been really on the contract side, supporting corporate healthcare, hospitality, education, uh, up through uh, current day business today. We do very, very little residential business currently. Um, it is a 
business that we've kind of crossed back into a little bit over the last several years. Yep. Uh, but the commercial market has really been um, a strong portion of our, of our business really um, since the late 80s. Nice. And you do hospitality work as well, right? So you, you guys kind of hospitality contract and hospitality contract, healthcare, higher education, and then uh, the government sector as well. Some GSA work and and other other segments of the government as well, both in the U.S. and in Canada. What would you say is your your biggest vertical? So our largest our largest uh, vertical portion of the business is healthcare and. Education with hospitality followed closely behind, um, and then corporate and our government sector are right there behind that. So we're fortunate that our business has really been a balanced business for a number of years. Um, so when you have issues like we're experiencing today with the virus, um, or if you've got an issue with the hospitality market that's flat, um, generally we don't see a large overall dip in our everyday business when one of those industries goes goes uh, soft because um, because of the balanced business that we have. Now, and this is like my memory, and quite frankly, we all know that that's a little skeptical these <laughs> days, but um, I recall you guys used to be one of the biggest providers of Krypton, of early Krypton and the woven Krypton. Is that correct? We have been a partner with Krypton since their inception, so the 27 years that they have been in business. Uh, we started with the beautiful product that was printed Krypton. Uh, okay. It was a very, very, very saleable product. It was not that gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> but it, was um, it, it really was the first product um, in my time in the business that really was a game changer in, in a product kind of hitting the market and taking a large market share. Uh, many of the vinyl or coated fabric people in the industry um, for a while feared that it would would really heavily cut into their market segment. Yeah. Um, I think it did initially, but over time it actually enhanced the vinyl sales. Um, and with what everyone is dealing with today with the uh, COVID virus, um, Things like coated products and your Krypton that can be bleach cleanable, wipeable, um, easy to maintain are what is going to be selling and being serviced in the marketplace for probably the next 18 to 24 months. You know, it's interesting. You, you mentioned the, the COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're kind of living in. And you mentioned hospitality earlier. And that I believe that's going to have a major impact on hospitality, especially in the restaurants and everything else moving forward is, you know, though they're not typically known to be the cleanest of environments. So I think having that uh, fabrics that are going to be protective to that and bleach cleanable and so forth, I think you're going to see a major push in that. Do you agree? Definitely. The, the calls that we are getting from the various market segments, hospitality being uh, one of the main ones, are asking for items with that are cleanable, wipeable, or with a finish, be it Krypton or other competitive finishes that create a barrier or a solid surface that can be cleaned and disinfected. Um, so it is definitely something that's being looked at and I think will be the um, main focus for us as a company and for many of our customers. The big question is um, antimicrobials and antibacterials over the last 12 to 18 months have been pushed to be removed. Um, people like Kaiser and uh, Herman Miller's and other major industry um, companies um, believe that the antimicrobials are not beneficial and they don't really kill any of the bacteria. They allow it to mutate and become stronger. And the best way to work is to disinfect and clean the product properly, be it with bleach or other types of cleaners. So we are um, actively updating our website. We'll be launching a new website that will have searchable features um, that will allow customers to put in a cleaner that they're using and show all the textiles that will be able to be used with that cleaner and perform in the field and so forth. 
So nice. Believe that, that is is a strong part of where things will be moving. Nice. Well, then we'll have to make sure to add that to my resource library because we just added Meyer Fabrics this week uh, to the library, and you're the first binders to be formatted in this new way, and congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you very much. We are very excited to be part of my resource library. I've talked to you about it for many years, and <laughs> we were uh, in the middle of many other changes, but we are excited to be part of the new format and the launch and um, have already gotten positive response from our sales team and from customers in the field. So we look forward to uh, added business and uh, to help my resource library also build their presence in the market as well. Thank you. Thank you. So it, it actually kind of brings up a very interesting point to me is so I, I pride myself on knowing kind of a lot of, like I do a lot of factory tours. And in fact, I was just back at your place last uh, year at the third quarter, I think is when I was back there and you took me to that barbecue place for, for yes. lunch. I can't remember the name of it, but oh my God, that was delicious. <laughs> um, but I toured your facility and I think even when I first met you, I kind of came in with a um, preconceived notion that I would see looms and how textiles are actually made could you share with me just kind of how does the textile industry work? So the textile industry in North America works somewhat differently than it does in Europe. Um, in, in North America, the people that sell to the dealer, designer, specifier, end user, and to many of the furniture manufacturers are really converters or jobbers um, for the most part, some distribution. Um, we really act as a converter or jobber and do a little bit of distribution. So the converter and jobber end of things are really where you develop your own textile design. So you create the pattern, uh, be it on a woven textile, a panel fabric, um, a privacy curtain or a coated fabric, and then you determine who you want to partner with. So we would go to a, um, joint partner and mill uh, supply chain partner and say, we're looking for you to weave and produce this product for us. We want it in this construction. So we would maybe want it in a, in a recycled polyester, or we want it in a biodegradable polyester, or we want it in a solution dyed nylon, or we want it to be a krypton, or we want it to be a coated fabric. So we may develop it and it's going to be a vinyl or it could be a polyurethane. So we determine who is the best partner for us and for the product to be able to bring the product to market with all the performance characteristics that we and our clients need, but also to be able to hit a price point that is um, good for the marketplace to sell volume, uh, but also to be competitive uh, where the market is. Okay. So when you, I, let's dive into that just for a few seconds here. But when, when you design a pattern, how, who does that? Do you have a designer on staff then that's designing it? or We have, we have, um, we have designers on staff. But we also use outside design consultants um, that do design. So okay. um, depending on who that is, some of them still do it in the old school format where they hand sketch and draw and provide that, we would provide that to the mill, and then they would have one of their technical people do a lot of the cleanup and, and that end of it, and then once that's woven in the first colorway, then we would determine, yes, we want to move forward with it. We would weave a blanket on the product, so a blanket is generally, it's woven in full width, so on upholstery seating, it's woven at about 54 to 58 inches in width, so you'll have six to eight, um, various colors going the length of the blanket and then you fill in your fill colors from the side so in when a blanket's developed you could have somewhere between 300 to 800 colorways to choose from wow so when we developed that product we would go back through the blanket we would narrow it to the color line that we are selecting once that is done then we would run a short uh, piece usually three to five yards to verify that there is no issues with the colors that were selected, and then it would go into production. And then depending on, on who we're working with and so forth, that is woven in a minimum order quantity based on uh, their setups and so forth. So 
on yarn dyed product where the yarn is has the color on it first, those amounts tend to be smaller in quantity, usually 120 yards uh, roughly per skew. Um, when you develop piece dyed product, which are is fabric that is woven in a grayish or white state, um, that product we put up in 10,000 to 15,000 yards of product at a time undyed. And then we dye it in various dye lot sizes depending on our partner's jets and their setup. So those could be as little as 150 yards of a color up to 1,000 yards per color. Um, so when you're doing those, um, that product tends to be more price competitive, but your minimums uh, to bring it to market are much, much larger. So okay. you're, seeing, you're, you're bringing your overall cost down, uh, knowing that you're going to sell more volume. Um, so those are, the, those are the two various various options on woven products. We work with primarily domestic mills uh, in North America. Um, however, we do work with mills all over Europe, um, as well as in the Pacific Rim. Um, and we do that based on constructions and the types of products that they bring to market. Um, at one point in time, when I started in the business, um, not long after I was out of college, we were probably buying from 45 to 50 mills that were all in the U.S. or in the U.S. or in Canada. I um, bought a little bit from Europe. Um, over the late 80s into the late 90s, those mills dwindled. They either went out of business or were acquired by other industry partners, um, or um, they changed and went into a different industry. Um, we started adding more diverse supply chain, uh, kind of when that happened, and doing more, um, some in England, some in Italy, uh, some in Belgium. Uh, some in Turkey, um, and then probably over the last 15 to 20 years, we started doing more in the Pacific Rim in uh, both, uh, actually in Korea, Thailand, uh, and some in China as well, um, and a little bit out of Indonesia. Um, okay. but the volume of what Meyer does is domestically produced product. It's, it's well over 85% of our offering is produced in, in North America. We call the product milled, milled in America. So we include all of the U.S. and Canada in that. So, and correct me geographically, but where, where would like a, a mill central be? So like, where would they all so, be located? Yeah, so in the, in the U.S., the bulk of the mills are in the Carolinas, so okay. North, North and South Carolina, and then there's a pocket of them in Pennsylvania, um, and then also in New Jersey, and there used to be um, a stronger portion of mills in the uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts area. Hmm. And then there's also a, uh, a group of them up in Canada. So um, in, in French Canada, uh, up in Montreal, Quebec, uh, St. George's area, yep. area um, is primarily where a lot of the mills, they originally were all developed along um, water uh, streams because a lot of the mills use a lot of water in production. Yep. Um, so a lot of the old line mills were all on either rivers or large, large creeks that would provide a water source for them for dyeing and finishing a product. Interesting. So I have a very off the line question here, but I, I see something behind you. There's a big wine cellar right behind you. You are in your conference room, right? I am in our conference room. Yes. So okay. our, there's a, very good story about that. Our father, um, who worked here in the business for over 60 some years, um, as he started traveling to the West Coast, um, he started an affinity for wine. He would go out to call on customers in California and Washington and Oregon. And initially he would take a couple of hours here and there and, and make his way to a winery. Um, he enjoyed it so much eventually that my mother started traveling with him and they would spend weekends in the wine country. And so he joined a large number of wine clubs where you would get a bottle or two a month. In our old building that we discussed earlier, there was a coal bin in the building that as a young man, he would actually go on the weekends with his uncles during the winter and put coal in the furnace to keep the building warm. 
um, as that went away and the building was heated with oil uh, and then later gas, um, that coal bin was turned into a wine cellar for our father and the company. Uh, when we moved to this facility, we didn't want to leave that in the building down there, so we built a new wine cellar uh, when we retrofitted the, exist the new building that we're in now. So I am sitting in front of a 10 foot by 30 foot uh, wine cellar that has a window here in the conference room, one into our big event room, and one into our uh, kitchen that the employees use. Um, so the the wine cellar is about 5,000 bottles of wine. So, uh, you most, know, I noticed you didn't take me in there, Rob, when <laughs> I was there for my for my tour. So, <laughs> well, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't know that you really liked wine. I know that you're generally more of a uh, Jack Daniels man. That, that this is true. This is true. But you know, happy wife, happy life. My my That's wife fine. loves wine. So <laughs> we, will, we will have to send your lovely bride a nice bottle of wine. Yeah. So um, so that, that's great. You've given us a, a, a very good understanding of you know, kind of the textile industry as a whole. But w with the wine, that kind of spurred a question in my mind because there is a a myth. Let's call it a myth, and maybe I even started it. That um, when you actually name the actual textiles and you name the actual uh, patterns, uh, I was always under the impression that there had to be bottles of wine involved in the naming process. On, on occasion, for many, many years, when my father was very active in, in the business, that was definitely a uh, usual ritual when it came time to name the, name the patterns and the collections at the time. So. Uh, it, a lot of time it was toward the end of the work day and uh, bottles would be brought out of the cellar and, uh, and yes, uh, a, a bottle or two or three would be consumed while that work was being done. So that is not a myth. Okay. Good. I, I knew I heard this story from somewhere. I just would, every place I go, I'm like, you know, the, how do they come up with these weird names on it? There's got to be alcohol involved. I mean, there just has to be. Yes, there, there, there was for many, many years, and as you can see, it's still here and still, still in practice. <laughs> still in practice. I love it. Um, all right, so we got just a few more minutes, but I want to talk to you just real quick about like kind of the top of the mind. So what, what's going on in our industry right now? Uh, I have probably calls every single day of you know, what the new world or what our new industry is going to be like. Do you have any input on that that you want to add to? Like, how are your reps going to be in front of clients? How is Meyer Fabrics going to stay in front of clients? That is definitely kind of the main question in the market right now is how do we stay in front of the clients? How do we get in front of the clients, uh, both the designer, the specifier, the end user, the dealer, um, them being comfortable allowing people back into their facilities and not bringing in something that may get their staff um, sick or infected. Um, so it is definitely something that we are looking at and addressing. Um, the last four to six weeks, we have spent a ton of time on social media and marketing and pushing out PowerPoints and Zoom meetings and so forth. And while I think that has been phenomenal uh, and has been extremely well received by many in the industry, I think that will still be part of the way that things are launched and, and presented to people. Um, I believe that in some of the major cities that have much smaller facilities and they've got people working in smaller footprints, that many of those people may continue to work from home, maybe not five days a week, but they may work from home three days a week or four days a week and come into the office for certain meetings. Um, but I believe it is going to be much more difficult for Meyer as a company and, and our, our, our other furniture manufacturer partners and our competitors to get in front of, to get in front of that customer. Yep. And how we, how we achieve that, I think, is yet to be uh, figured out. But it is something that we are working on, and I believe that tools like my resource library are imperative uh, as additions to what we're doing on our own website to be the voice of Meyer as a company and be the voice for our rep. Um, I do believe that our industry is a tactile industry. 
on not only the fabrics, but furniture, flooring, wall covering, et cetera. Um, and it's a people business. Um, they have to have trust uh, in you as a company, but also in our sales rep that is working with them. Um, they've got to have the honesty to let them know that we are providing them a product that works. And it's hard to get a lot of that across when you're not able to have that relationship and that face-to-face -face meeting um, on uh, a Zoom meeting or a webinar or what have you. I mean, there's a lot that can be shared, uh, but you really need to have that face-to-face -face interaction, even if it's for 15 to 20 minutes at a time when you, when you can get it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's going to be the key to the success of our company and, and others as well as things uh, work forward over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I think it, it's going to be a reshaping, right? It, but it's, it's fascinating that the ones that are really thinking it through, and I think there's going to be some really cool things that are going to come out of this. Um, hopefully, it, uh, it, it, hopefully we go back to being able to at least be in the same room. I don't know about you, but just the other day I went into a bank and went to shake the banker's hand because that's what I'm used to doing and was you know the the pullback and the you know the the whole elbow thing and i'm going well i'm not doing that so <laughs> but it's, it is fascinating it is definitely interesting being out in public whether you run into somebody in the grocery store or at the bank and yes that's the that's the cordial thing to do is you reach out and you've always shaken someone's hand for for all of your life and, and that's not what is happening and transpiring today or if it's someone you know well you go up and give them a hug. Um, it's yes, the, the social distancing or physical distancing as, as we have, we've used um, on a lot of our social media stuff. Yep. Uh, we still want to stay social with people uh, but the physical distancing is the, is the problem that um, is, is the long-term issue um, if we can't get back together, and, and I hope it's not for for the long term, uh, but I think we're we're looking at that for at least through uh, the Fourth of July in many many parts of the country, and parts may be longer than that. So yeah. uh, we, as a company, look forward to the opportunity to be back in front of a customer, uh, at least in the same room as the customer to be able to present and share and, and assist and help. And that's really, really one of the strengths of our company and, and our reps is, is for us to be there to uh, provide solutions and answers for them when they need things. Um, I mean, it is a selling process, but um, you have to be the solution and the right answer for the customer to solve their problem and their need uh, for their client. Yeah, agreed. All right. Well, let me give you an actual opportunity. I, I do want to ask one other question about um, Meyer Fabrics, and then I would love for you to just tell us anything that you would like to actually tell us about Meyer Fabrics. But um, my question is, I'm looking at your binders on my resource library. You've got a lot of different patterns. You've got a lot of different styles, privacy curtains, seating, um, it goes on and on. How many different SKUs does Meyer Fabrics actually have? We currently have about 9,000 plus S active SKUs in our offering. Um, it ranges, as you mentioned, from privacy curtains to panel fabrics to draperies to some leather uh, to our coated fabrics, which encompasses vinyl, polyurethane, silicones, um, and then a couple of couple of binders of, of Krypton products, um, and then four additional binders of seating fabrics that range from basic entry-level product through to performance fabrics um, that have various finishes, whether it's some umbrella products that are suitable for indoor, outdoor, the solution dyed nylon items that have high UV or, and are easily bleach cleanable. Um, so, we servicing the markets that we are in have to have products that really kind of cover the gamut of the offering um, from the corporate to the healthcare to the hospitality, the education side of the business, um, be it planes and textures to large scale multicolored jackers um, that are used on various sizes and scales of furniture. 
Um, so with that being said, um, we don't really envision our line getting a lot larger SKU wise, but we are annually adding in the neighborhood of 25 to as many as 40 new patterns in a year. Yeah. And that could, that could comprise somewhere between 500 to 1,000 SKUs uh, that are changed out on an annual basis. Um, it wow. is a fashion business. Um, we do have a great many staples in our line that have been in our line for years and years and years that we continue to update the color offering from. Um, but then we have to have all of those new designs and fashion forward uh, colors that are brought out in collections um, every year. A product, when I started in the business in the 80s, may stay in your line for 10 or 12 years. You still have your staple products, um, your textures, your, your velvets, your mohairs, those kinds of things that could be in your line for 20 or 25 years as long as you update the color lines and so forth. Uh, but a lot of your patterns range somewhere in the neighborhood of five to seven years if you're lucky. And if mm. you have a great runner, you may recolor those and, and get, get slightly longer out of that. But the, um, the appetite for new and different in our industry um, is, uh, is very broad. Uh, we do have products that we have in our offering uh, that we may have had in our line years and years ago that fall out of the line and come back five or 10 years later um, in a new construction. They could have been in a nylon product and now they're in uh, all polyester or something mm. else. So there's archives that we can work from as well, in addition to using uh, inside designers and outside consultants to work on developing product for us as well. So you guys are gonna absolutely love Chicago from your couch by my resource library this year because Obviously, with the trade shows all canceled, we're putting together that library for you with 25 to 40 new products. You guys, and that that spans from June until the end of December, so you could add to it whenever you would like to, but uh, that'll be a good thing for you guys to have in there. We are very excited about the opportunity to be part of Chicago from my couch, yep. um, and we'll have uh, the first grouping of products ready ready to go in there in the next 30 to 45 days. And nice. we'll continue to add uh, to that probably about every 45 to 60 days after that. So there's at least six new collections that will be uh, ready between now and the end of the year to be uh, added to Chicago for my couch. That's awesome. We're gonna have a lot of fun with that. I think uh, that's gonna be a good thing. Um, Tell me, what else do you want to talk about with Meyer Fabrics? This is your open platform. What do you want to leave everybody with? I'd like to leave everybody with um, kind of the rich history of our family business, having now been in business for 123 years. Um, we want to thank everyone for the business that they have given us over the years. We want to thank all of the customers uh, that are working on the front lines uh, with the hospitals, nursing homes, and assisted living centers uh, dealing with the COVID virus. Um, and want to thank um, my resource library as well, well as our sales team um, and our customers of the future. And we look forward to adding many of you from uh, the My Resource Library family uh, that have been using uh, all of the resources that they provide to the industry. Um, and look forward to uh, hitting the ground running when the virus is behind us uh, and forward to a strong uh, end to the year of 2020 and an even stronger 2021. Well, thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate you, you coming in. Hopefully Steve in the, uh, um, in the background over there, he didn't get on the camera with you, but hopefully he, he held up all the good cue cards for you. Steve, Steve, Steve's been here, and uh, my brother Mick joined us uh, a little way through the interview as well. And, uh, nice. So, so Steve and Rick and Mick and all of the Myers say thank you for uh, everything that you and MRL are doing for us and, and our customers as well. But we really thank you and appreciate Meyer Fabrics being and working through this process with us. Um, we're happy to have your binders on the shelves. They're live now, and uh, just really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate your entire team as well.